Hey guys, Jake Carlson here, host of the Modern Leadership Podcast. Are you ready to focus on amplifying your leadership superpowers? Let's go. Good morning, my friends and fellow elite achievers. Welcome to Modern Leadership, the podcast where each week we sit down with authors, entrepreneurs, and leaders and dive into their journey, the ups, the downs, and the lessons learned. And today, I want to welcome an amazing guest, Warwick Fairfax. Warwick is the founder of Crucible Leadership, a philosophical and practical breakthrough in turning business and personal failures into the fuel for igniting a life of significance. Warwick was only 26 when, as the fifth generation heir to a media empire bearing his family name, he led and lost a multi billion dollar public takeover bid. The result? The company founded by his great great grandfather slipped from the family control after 150 years, leaving him to step back and examine not only his own shortcomings and losses, but also his life's principles and the lessons he learned from family members who came before him and some of history's greatest leaders. Warwick, welcome to Modern Leadership. How are you today? Pretty good, Jake. Uh, Great to be here. I'm excited to jump into this podcast. And before we hit record, you and I were talking, and there's just so much going on in this story, so much to learn from. But before we jump in too far, give us a little flavor of who you are, aside from what we read in the bio. Yeah, I mean, I live in Annapolis, Maryland, outside of D.C., have three kids. My life is relatively uh, ordinary compared to my life before, you know, um, it's so life is good, uh, active in my local church, you know, helping my help, help my kids with all sorts of things as they were growing up, you know, on the soccer fields and what have you. So my life is not very unusual at the moment, uh, very different from before, So, which is kind of nice. A little bit of normal is okay, you know, especially after what, I, about my, uh, what I've been through in the past. Well, and that's where we want to go on this podcast. And I want to thank you before we even jump in, for being so open and honest about the experience that you went through, because, you know, a lot of us go through challenges. And as you mentioned before, not a lot of us suffer challenges that end up on the front page of the newspaper. So I think there's so much to learn from your story. So take us back and tell us about this company and kind of set us up for how we're going to discuss this episode of the podcast. So this newspaper company was founded 150 years ago by my great-great-grandfather, John Fairfax, starting off with the Sydney Morning Herald that's the, still the main paper of record in Sydney, kind of like the Washington Post or New York Times, if you will. And he came out from, uh, from England, wanted a new start, and uh, started this newspaper company. It grew over the generations. He was a person of great faith, great employer, um, really did everything well, terrific husband, father. I mean, just check every every box in life you want to achieve, and he achieved it. So the company grew over the generations to cover newspapers, TV stations, magazines, radio, newsprint mills, became a you know huge empire. And by the time I came along, there was always a lot of pressure to uh, continue to the next generation. But I guess I had the feeling as I was growing up and after my father was no longer chairman, which is a whole nother story, that I had this sense, uh, rightly or wrong, it had lost its way, that it wasn't being managed as well as it had been, maybe uh, not run along the visions of, of the founder in terms of just an approach to media. And one could debate whether that's true or not, but that sort of uh, set me up to really feel like I, I needed to do something. And I was 26 when I launched this takeover. And yeah, and take us back a little bit to that Warwick. So this is early 80s, right? I mean, mid early 80s. Yeah, it's uh, 87 when I launched it. So yeah, a long time ago. And you're 26. But tell us a little bit about your background, because you were very well educated and had a business background. Yeah, I mean, I, I went did my undergraduate at Oxford University, like my dad and some other relatives. Uh, I worked on Wall Street in, in banking, and then went to Harvard Business School. Where as I was in the process of graduating, a lot of these wheels were turning about the takeover. So in theory, I was as well, you know, I was very well educated, but obviously uh, I made some enormous mistakes and assumptions. So, you know, people write books about what they don't teach you at Harvard Business School. I mean, uh, Harvard Business School is a great place, but, you know, it doesn't insulate you from being human and frail, I'm afraid. 
to be clear, this isn't the story of an heir that's driving around in his Ferrari and not really paying attention to what's going on and kind of a playboy. This is a hardworking, very well-educated, you took this very seriously as you came into this. And yeah, you were young. A lot of great entrepreneurs are young. And you had had this experience on Wall Street that you took back now to the family business. And here we are, you know, mid to late 80s. And you come over and kind of say, something's not running ideally, maybe not in the same vein that the founder saw it. Right. And so take us from there. So, you know, and the funny thing is, it wasn't about power or control. I mean, money and power has never been that attractive to me. You know, when you grow up with money, you see how money certainly doesn't make you happy. I didn't run around with the trappings of wealth. I mean, while other people drove into the executive parking lot with, you know, Daimlers and Jaguars, I actually had a, a red Toyota Camry. Oh, yeah. That's what I drove. I mean, why do you need more than that? I mean, I was fine. I'm 26. So the whole trappings of power, if you will, kind of wasn't my deal. But I was just sort of young, idealistic, felt like it company needed to be run better. And so uh, there was rumors that the company was in play from takeover because it was publicly held. Yeah. And stock price started rocketing up. So, you know, you're young, idealistic, and, you know, let's go. Something needs to be done. Let's get in there. That kind of youthful mindset, if you will. So for those of us who aren't really familiar with kind of this takeover opportunity, it's a publicly traded company, which means ownership of the company is available for purchase by the public. And so you started hearing these rumors that big groups like institutions or some a group of people were going to try to buy up a large amount of shares and basically take over the company. Yeah. I mean, basically, you know, one of the corporate raiders has then existed in the 80s. And even though we had about 50%, the um, the thought was if somebody made an attractive enough offer that some minor, me- some some smaller shareholdings would sell, which would then create a domino effect. I yeah. mean, you know, one could debate whether it would have happened, but the stock market believed something w- was going on because it, the price went up. So that was the conventional wisdom out there that something, as they say back then, that the company was in play, if you will. Yeah. And, and keep in mind that what was happening in the stock market in general, not just with your company, but the stock market in general in the late 80s, it was a very turbulent time as well. Absolutely. Yeah. A lot of takeovers were happening back then. It was, uh, yeah, you're right. Very turbulent times. Okay. So this results in essentially you losing control of the family business. Somebody ends up coming in and taking it over. So I mean, in the short term, it was a success in the sense that the takeover succeeded. But we ended up with too much debt for a variety of reasons. Some family members sold out that I didn't think would. October 87 stock market crashed, a bunch of things. And while we did get operating profits up significantly that showed that maybe the company could be better managed, the company had so much debt that three years later, when Australia went into recession, the company went bankrupt. So I was in control of this company for three years, you know, from 26 to just shy of 30. And, uh, and then it went bankrupt, and um, I had to figure out what to do with my life then. Yeah, and we're talking about, I mean, comparing this to an established organization, media company, like a Wall Street Journal or Times would be. Exactly. And all of a sudden, you have this bankruptcy, and you're the face of the company. And so at this time, yeah. they kind of look to you, a lot of fingers. And, and it's not just the public and shareholders, but it's also the family, right? That's kind of pointing their fingers sure. at you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the media... And you remember, the media like the New York Times, Washington Post, they work for this company. So, you know, one could debate whether the media is biased one way or the other. But when you're affecting their lives and their jobs, you know, nobody takes that lightly. So, uh, you know, what have you done to me? What have you done to us? You know, what were you thinking? And, you know, some legitimate questions. So, needless to say, there was some uh, somewhat uh, unfavorable press coverage, which I fully understand. I I get it. Well, and this leads us to kind of the the heart of the conversation and why you're such a great guest for this podcast, because this was your kind of crucible moment. And this was a stepping stone where you've kind of taken that moment, that very struggling moment and built from there to where you're at today. And it wasn't easy, but kind of talk to us about what happened next, this crucible moment and how it started to define where you were going to go. Yeah. So First few years were, were pretty difficult. I mean, I was not in a particularly good place. It was my whole life, I thought, I'd been put on this earth to 
carry on the family dynasty for more generations. When I did all my education, Harvard Business School Banking, none of it was about what do I want to do? What am I good at? It was more kind of like duty on a country, which I'm all for. But in this case, it was it was all about the family business. And so now that it was gone, I had to ask questions like, well, what do I do with my life now? And because I'd messed up on such a big scale from my perspective, it's like, what else should I try? I mean, it was hard to get a job as sort of, uh, you know, failed media mogul. I mean, that's not a good calling card for a normal job. It took years to be able to bounce back. I ended up starting off a few years later with a local aviation uh, services company in Maryland and did some financial analysis, business analysis, you know, reasonably analytical, strategic planning. So I clawed my way back up in terms of my own self-esteem, thinking, well, maybe there's something I can do without screwing up. And so the first really challenge was just the self-esteem. But you know, a real, uh, a real turning point for me in which I thought, you know, maybe what I've been through can be used to help other people. At the local church we go to uh, in Annapolis, the pastor was giving a message and uh, on the life of David, and he said, okay, I'd like you to give a few minute talk about a righteous person, falsely persecuted, you know, bouncing back. I said, well, I don't know that I consider myself a righteous person, falsely persecuted. I kind of dug my own problems. I mean, you know, a lot of it was kind of my fault, but fine. And so somehow, as I'm talking about what I went through and just really seeing your significance in more than just money and career, but something more eternal, something more lasting, just some of these lessons, and that life isn't over despite a huge failure, just regular folks came up to me afterwards and said, that really helped me. And so at that point, I thought, if I can really find a message that talks about what life is really about, that you can recover from failure, from humiliation. Sometimes we fail and it's our fault. Sometimes it's not our fault. Maybe it's a health crisis. Sometimes bad things happen to us and we didn't do anything wrong. But either way, you've got to try to figure out, well, what does that mean? And how can I learn from this crucible, this failure, if you will, and, uh, and move on and somehow help others? So that was really the whole genesis. That seven-minute talk in church really was a huge turning point in my life, thinking, okay, maybe I can use this pain, if you will, for some good to help others. And, you know, to be honest, this is the reason that I wanted to bring you on the podcast, because I look at it and I say every business leader is going to go through ups and downs. This podcast really revolves around the journey of entrepreneurs and authors and leaders. And there's always ups and there's always down in every occupation. But I looked at your story and I said, there is so much that we can take away because sometimes we find ourselves on the wrong bus. If you talk Jim Collins, Mm -hmm. we find ourselves on the wrong bus or we find ourselves in the wrong seat on the bus, or sometimes we're in the right seat, but we make a decision that has a negative impact. Sometimes we lose our job. Sometimes we lose our family. Sometimes, you know, there's a lot of things that happen and I want to talk about bouncing back. So you started with this first step of really identifying what you wanted, what Warwick wanted. And I want to ask you how we can do that, how our listeners can start with themselves and determine what they want. There's a number of places to start. I mean, often in my world, it can start with a crisis. Maybe you've been fired from your job. Maybe if you're an entrepreneur, if you're an entrepreneur, you have to get used to the fact that most entrepreneurs' businesses, you know, do fail. I mean, it's just the cycle of being an entrepreneur. And you got to have a certain stomach for that, for, you know, okay, it failed. What can we do? So the first step is, you know, what are the lessons learned? In my case, to use your analogy, I was on the wrong seat on the bus. I mean, I'm not a Rupert Murdoch, take charge, let's go, let's go at it, take no prisoners kind of executive. I'm a reflective advisor. I mean, it was just a terrible fit. I'm good on boards. I sit on a couple of nonprofit boards. I have done a lot of executive coaching. So I don't like to be upfront, you know, I'm more, I'd rather listen than talk. A lot of times I'm very curious. So it was just an incredibly poor fit. So that's one thing to examine is when something like that happens is part of the problem is, you know, you were on the wrong seat on the bus. It was just a wrong fit. And then you've got to ask yourself, well, what is the right seat? How am I wired? You can't move forward in terms of, you know, a business making your vision come to reality unless you first figure out, what, well, who am I? How am I wired? I mean, everybody needs to have a pretty good understanding of that, because if you don't, how, could, how do you know what opportunity is a good one to take or not? You know, it's got to fit with how you wired. 
Yeah, I agree with that. Now, one of the things you talk about, Warwick, is these elements, four elements that will bring leaders through their own crucible moments. And we've kind of established that all of us are probably going to have crucible moments throughout our careers at different times. And so I wanted to ask you to walk us through kind of these elements that Mm -hmm. we can establish to walk through our own moments of failure or life challenges. First thing to do is just think about, you know, what are the lessons learned that I can learn from that first step? And so after uh, looking at, um, you know, kind of how you refined, you've got to start thinking of, well, what does, are there clues in that crucible moment for how I'm designed? And so that's really a good first step. So, you know, just some uh, thoughts about how to figure that out. There are a lot of obviously good assessments, uh, whether it's uh, Myers-Briggs, DISC, what have you. But really at a more basic level to figuring out how you're wide, look at clues for what are the things that you enjoy doing in life? And what are the things you're good at? Look at it over, you know, from middle school, high school, 20s, 30s, beyond. And I think you'll often find some clues about things that you love doing and things that you were uh, superb at doing. So armed with that, when you think about really the next step after a fine and design is vision, the clues to finding a compelling vision is it's got to be lined up with how you're wired. But then you've got to say, well, what are my um, you know be- beliefs? What are the, my passions, the things that I think that are important? So you really want to understand that it could be a religious way of thought, it could be a philosophical perspective, but what are the things that really matter? And sometimes when you've gone through a crucible moment, you say to yourself, I don't want anybody to suffer the way I've suffered. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to help people that were abused or whatever it is. And I think this is very common, Warwick, when people go through what you call a crucible moment. I mean, these are big deals. These aren't just your everyday setbacks, but big deals. When you go through it, it's often very common that when you step out of it, this becomes kind of a rallying point, a big why for you, because you know what it's like to not just hear about it, but to experience it. And maybe you don't want others to experience it. Or on the positive exactly. side, if you have a great experience that you come through on the other end with this heroic story, you want others to be able to experience that euphoria that you had as well. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, you just have this vision you know, wouldn't it be cool if somebody invented X or something that you're really passionate about? You know, maybe you love uh, science fiction and the whole technology and how do you become the next Steve Jobs or what's that next breakthrough? So whatever you do, especially if you're a, a small business owner, you've got to love it. You've got to be passionate about it. You've got to have the skills, the aptitude. It's got to be in touch with your wiring, but it's got to matter. And to me, you know, obviously, I have a great bent about leading a life of significance. In other words, it's not all about career and money. Not that, not that that's bad or success, but that's hard to really motivate you over the decades. What really motivates, at least to me, for most people, is, is this going to help other men and women? Is this going to really make the world a better place? What's that altruistic element that you think that really matters? Like in Southwest, their original vision was connecting people, connecting families at affordable prices for air travel. Mm-hmm. That was their reason for being. And, and who could, you know, how could you not be motivated by that if you're in the, uh, you know, airplane space? So when you think of that vision, you've got to feel like it matters, you're passionate about it. And somehow you just sense that in some altruistic way, it's going to make the world a better place because that is very motivating and will keep you going through, you know, the, the peaks and valleys will inevitably uh, fall. So that's, that's probably the key to go from then vision to reality is perseverance has definitely helped if you think it's going to help people. Really, the final element of making it reality is for most people, you need a team. It's difficult for one man or woman to accomplish things single-handedly. You need a group of fellow travelers around you. People that buy into your vision, they'll have complementary skills, obviously not the same ones you will, but you all will agree on the mission. You all will believe, you know what, this thing is important. You know, yeah, we want to be successful and all, but it's more than that. It's what we do matters. So if you arm yourself with a team of, of fellow believers, if you will, in your mission, and you've got the inherent passion for it and the wiring, then you've got a far better chance of making your dreams come true and your vision a reality. That's really the last step. That's the key. And it's so important the order that you gave them, right? You start out with, you're going through this crucible moment, you figure out 
you know, what lessons there are to be had from this experience. Then you combine that with your passion and your belief. You make it matter to you because that leads to this next step, which is this perseverance, this grit. As we know, as an entrepreneur, as a business leader, sometimes you just got to put your head down and keep on trucking, even though it's tough. All of that leads to you being able to be a leader that somebody will follow. And that's when you talk about a team, fellow believers gathering your tribe, people are going to follow somebody with passion, somebody with belief, Mm -hmm. somebody that knows where they're going. And if you have that, people will follow you. If not, you're going to find out you're out on an island. Absolutely true. You know, when you think of examples like Walt Disney, most people have been successful. You'll have naysayers saying, it won't happen. You're a fool. Give up. Maybe most people. And you know, if you're an entrepreneur, you've got to believe enough in what you're doing to persevere. So with Walt Disney, I mean, time and time again, you know, he started with the original vision of just making uh, animated stories that people enjoy. But then he went with Snow White, you know, an hour and a half movie. People said, nobody will sit in it for an hour and a half movie. There's just no way. Then when he started thinking of theme parks, Theme parks at the time were, you know, not particularly nice places to go in, not that safe. There was alcohol, which is fine, but not if you want to bring, you know, small children to an amusement park. It's just you didn't do that. So he said, no, I'm I'm going to make it such that you're going to have to pay to come in and it's going to be very clean. And people said, well, you, you can't do that. It won't work. Time and time again, he went against the conventional wisdom. So that's really a picture of what you have to be as an entrepreneur. Don't believe the naysayers. You've got to believe in your vision and say, okay, I respect other people's opinion, but I believe in what I'm doing and we're going to keep going. And it's easy for us to say today, oh, if I would have thought of Disneyland or Disney, you know, the Disney company, how easy, you know, what a, what a great skyrocket ride up. It's harder for us to put ourselves back in Mr. Disney's shoes and say everybody was against him. It was tough for him to even get money to do it. And those exactly. first couple of years were like you coming out of your, your family business. I mean, people aren't going to take an investment. People aren't going to take a chance on you until you take a chance on yourself. And throughout your entire description of these elements of bringing leaders through our own crucible moments, the thing that kept coming out to me is this idea of intentional introspection, this yes. intentionally looking internally to identify what lessons you learn? What are your beliefs and passions? What kind of grit or perseverance do I have? What kind of team do I need to surround myself with? And I think Warwick, this is an area of leadership that is really lacking in our society today. And and that's this opportunity to take a step back, be silent, and to think through strategically what the next step is going to be because we're so busy fighting fires. We're so busy reacting to what's going on around us that it's very difficult for us to be proactive with what needs to happen. And I think throughout what you just described, crucible moments force you to be introspective, to be silent, to think through strategically what your next step is going to be. And then from there, be proactive instead of reactive. Absolutely. And what's sort of interesting, you know, I love reading about historical leaders. And, you know, one of my favorites is Abraham Lincoln, that most historians in the U.S. view him as the top president every year, every few years to do the survey. And when I had to say, what was the key to his success? It was what you're talking about, this sort of introspection in the sense that he knew who he was and he was incredibly secure within himself. You could say, well, Mr. Lincoln, you're not very good at that. And he said, yep, you're right. I'm you know, pretty hopeless at that. And you could give him feedback he disagreed with. He was just very secure within himself. And so he could surround himself with a team of rivals the book by Doris Kearns Goodwin, people that act were his rivals to the Republican nomination, they didn't like him, they didn't respect him, they thought he was this country bumpkin from Illinois. I mean, who brings the team around them who don't respect them and who really look down on them? But you think that, you know, you need the team. So it was that sense of character, that innate, really immense humility and, and uh, inner security within who you are. That's really the key to leading in any in any venue. Just not being insecure, just be secure with who you are, know who you are and who you're not. And very few men and women are willing to do that because that's a little scary, a little fearful. We all want to put on our masks. And that's why there are too many Abraham Lincolns. You know, it's it's not an easy road to just take that road of vulnerability, authenticity and 
really being secure within yourself. Which is the path that we just took. I mean, when you think back of what we just talked about for the last 25 minutes on this podcast, was you really exemplifying somebody who's authentic, somebody who is vulnerable, somebody who could have kind of hid out from the problems that you had in your youth, but you step forward and use these, this crucible moment to really impact you for positive and not just you, but those around you, those who are listening to this podcast, we are better for the opportunity to spend this time with you. And I thank you for coming on and talking about this. At this point in the show, I love to transition, shift gears just a little bit, go to a section I call learning from leaders. Does that sound like a plan? Absolutely. All right. In this section, I ask you four questions and these are my favorite four questions. The first one, book currently on your Kindle or bedside table, Warwick, what are you reading? Well, it's interesting. It's the uh, follow-up to Doris Kearns Goodwin's book on Lincoln. It's called Leadership in Turbulent Times. It examines Lincoln, Franklin Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, as well as uh, Lyndon Johnson. Johnson. So great uh, comparison about leaders who went through crucible moments and how they dealt with them. So, you know, for me in my world of crucible leadership, uh, I love that book. Yeah, it sounds like a very fascinating book, especially as you start to dissect some of the different approaches to different leaders in their moment, their crucible moments. So a very good thought on that one. Our next question is your leadership superpower. Well, this was really interesting to me because I took the assessment on your website and it said I was an inspirational leader, which caused me to reflect because I wouldn't have thought that. But yet, as I think about it, you know, I love encouraging people. If I see somebody some of the organizations I work with doing something well, I will encourage with with specific, you know, uh, words about why that was good. To me, I love helping people achieve the seemingly impossible. So I guess I have a bit more inspiration and vision than perhaps I thought, because I'm not the typical upfront visionary leader. So maybe there are some lessons for other people. Maybe you don't think you're an inspirational leader, but, you know, if you're a positive kind of person that likes helping other people and believe that within reason, anything's possible. Maybe like me, you've got more inspiration in you than, than you realize. So that was a, a learning opportunity for me, I'd say. Well, and you did a great job of kind of describing it. I will pull back the curtain a little bit and tell you that originally when we developed the leadership assessment tool, we had that leadership superpower described as the enthusiastic leader. And mm-hmm. as we did more research and kind of looked at some of the leaders that were coming into that superpower, what we realized that enthusiasm is kind of the extroverted way of demonstrating this inspiration. Mm -hmm. But there are others that have a more introverted way of leading people. And you look at what your whole mission is with Crucible Leadership. It's taking people who are going through a specific downturn and giving them a platform to build from. And therefore, we decided to change it from enthusiastic leader to inspirational leader which essentially says you can lead by being not just enthusiastic and engaged out in the community and kind of rah-rah cheer- cheerleader, but also lead kind of quiet leadership as well. So I love that. Thank you for sharing that superpower. Our next question then is a motivational quote, philosophy, or mantra, something that you live by. You know, that's interesting. I mean, for me, it's um, this whole uh, concept of uh, lead a life of significance. It's you know, it's just this sort of notion that leadership is about more than um, than uh, than money and power. I mean, that's just been a huge a huge thing for me. So, yeah, it's uh, you know, I noticed your um, your email has something like that, doesn't it? Uh, family over uh, yeah, fortune. Before, yeah, family before fortune. Yeah, and I thought, boy, that's just perfect. You know, it's like it's. I'm not against success or money, but there's got to be more to life than that. To me, there's got to be a sense of you're helping other people. So, you know, in my own way, you know, I'm uh, on two nonprofit boards, church board, as well as the school my kids went to. And, you know, that doesn't pay me anything. But, you know, I love being involved in that because I feel like I'm helping causes that I care about over and above whatever I'm doing on Crucible Leadership. So, that sense of life is more than about money and, and career, um, about significance. To me, that's to me my guiding philosophy in life, and to the best of my ability, I try and live it. Yeah, and I love it, Warwick. I mean, you and I are kindred spirits. That family before fortune is the idea that you can have the life of your dreams. You can build the life of your dreams with the people you love. And the idea is there's nothing wrong with fortune. 
but do it with those you love. And that's what family before fortune really represents. And just one quick story on that. It's interesting. One of the things we do as a family on birthdays and what have you, we go around the table and, you know, what do you most admire and respect about whose ever birthday it is? And so, you know, we've done this for years, ever since our kids were very small. And when it came to talking about me, they, my boys who are sort of the athletic ones in the family always said, you know, dad, you were there at my soccer games, at my tennis match. Every year, they always say that. So what does that mean? Well, it's great to, you know, be an entrepreneur and be successful, but you want to be on the side of your kids, soccer games, lacrosse, basketball, whatever it is, because that matters. It, you know, it matters if you're there. So to your point, you know, family before fortune, you know, you can't, you never get that time back, especially when your kids are small and, you know, later on they'll tell you it matters. So anyway, whole nother subject, but, uh, yeah. But a very important one, and I really appreciate you bringing it up. Our final question in this section is the book that you most often gift to friends, family, or colleagues? But, you know, interesting question is I'm not like a pushy person. I'm more of a share with and share out. So I tend not to, here's a book you need to read. But if, if we're talking about leadership, invariably, I will probably mention more often than not, Darius Kearns Goodwin book uh, on Lincoln. I wouldn't actually give it to them because, you know, I like to be pushy. It's just kind of more my style, but that's probably the single best book in the leadership uh, space. So that's certainly in the realm we're talking about. That's the book I most often refer to. And I usually have a rule that when a book is recommended three times, I pick up a copy and read it. And we've talked about that book three times on this episode. (laughs) I think it's a sign that I need to pick it up and read it. I have not yet. And so I'm very excited. I love Lincoln. I see, I saw the movie, but I haven't sat down and read the book. Yeah. I appreciate us jumping through that learning from leaders section. Alas, our time is about up. So before we let you go, how can we find out more about you and connect further? My website is probably a good place to go, crucibleleadership.com. You can sign up for my blogs, which I send out a couple times a month it's on all different aspects of crucible leadership. I'm active on LinkedIn and social media. And if you go onto the front page of my website, there's also a um, Crucible Leadership Workbook where you can look at some of the elements and then interact with the material and try to figure out how does that fit in your life and um, you know what's your path to leading a life of significance. Well, that sounds perfect. And we'll link it all up on the show notes so our listeners can go to one place and get all the goodness that we talked about. Warwick, thank you so much for coming on the show, being so open and honest about your crucible moment and helping us as leaders to identify ways that we can overcome ours. Thank you for being this week's Modern Leadership Guest Expert. Thanks so much, Jake. All right, my friends, what did you think of that sitting down with Warwick? What a tremendous story, right? I mean, how many of us can really bounce back from losing a two and a half billion dollar family business and to really just have that positive perspective on life? I can't even imagine what it was like going through that crucible moment, those couple of years right after where you can't find a job. I mean, it's tough work. And I look at our lives. We all go through crucible moments, right? And it's through those moments that really define the path that we're going on. And I just love his optimism and the way he dug himself out of the challenge and is flourishing today and a great example, an inspiring leader to all of us. Of course, everything that we talked about on this episode of the podcast can be found at jakeacarlson.com slash ML125, episode 125. And until next week, I'm going to start with how I usually end. Everything is figure outable, right? You can figure out. If you have a crucible moment, everything is figure outable. So until next week, I want to wish you the very best of days, an even better life. And of course, don't forget it's figure outable. Thanks for listening to the Modern Leadership Podcast. You can find me on Facebook at Speaker Jake, on Twitter at Jake A. Carlson, and of course the website, jakeacarlson.com. See you there. Uh-huh.